Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and I'm so excited to have Peter Antonio with us. Age nine, Peter decided he wanted superpowers. So in a way only a child can, he set out to learn the impossible, how to read people's minds. 20 years later, Peter is now a highly sought after artist performing for blue chip companies and sold out theater crowds. His theater shows are interactive experiences where audiences have their mind read as Peter tells jokes and fortunes live on stage. Peter also now uses his wealth of knowledge in divination and tarot to show individuals and businesses how this ancient skill can be the difference maker in creative thinking, personal progress, and achievement. And if Peter at all looks familiar to you, it might be because of his recent audition on America's Got Talent, which is how I found out about Peter, and I was just floored by his performance, and I just had to have him on the show, and that's why we're here today. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. No, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Well, I loved your performance on the America's Got Talent audition. I just thought you were phenomenal. And I would love to start with uh, something that you mentioned in the beginning of your audition, which was that you started with tarot at age nine or 11, something like that, and kind of blossomed from there. So could you share a little bit about your origin story? Yeah, so I remember like as a kid, we were on holiday in the south of France and I was in like the aisle of the supermarket where they have like magazines and newspapers and stuff. And I saw a tarot deck and like I didn't really know what it was, but I knew that I wanted it. Like I just felt really drawn to it and like ended up getting it and sort of learning a lot about that. And also my auntie had always been very into like she's a traditional old Greek lady. So she was reading tea leaves and coffee grounds around us and predicting futures and stuff. So it was always sort of around me. And I became sort of fascinated with that at the same sort of time that I was super into comic books and like always wanted to superpower myself and thought like, oh, reading minds, that would be cool. And those sorts of two points ended up driving me towards, yeah, as I said, that sort of mindset of like, oh, well, I guess it's it's possible. Let's just learn how. And ended up learning a lot from sort of psychics and psychologists and hypnotists and magicians, just trying to understand how they all approach sort of figuring out what people were thinking and have stolen a lot of that and it built into doing stage shows where I'm sort of demonstrating those skills and yeah it's a it's been a fun ride when, when did you do your first stage show did you do anything as a child yeah I was sort of I showed friends a lot sort of weird things I was working on and like in retrospect thinking back to it like I was a pretty weird kid like sort of I was the one in the playground being like just think of something and I'll try and tell you what it is And then I did my first sort of proper stand up show when I was 16, 17. It was like the towards the end of high school. And we were doing like a fundraiser fundraiser for Red Nose Day. And I said, like, oh, I'll do I'll do a 40 minute show. No problem. Which is sort of like thinking back. It was incredibly ambitious, given that I'd like never performed on stage in that way with the mind reading before. And like I felt comfortable being on stage because I'd played cello since I was sort of 10. So I was like used to performing in that way, but not with the mind reading. And yeah, the first, the first stage show went really well. And then it sort of built from there. And I think I went to university to study music, but because I came from quite a working class background, like being a professional performer never really seemed like an option to me. Like it just wasn't something that occurred to me as an occupation. And it was while I was at university that I was getting paid to do shows and they were covering my bills that I suddenly dawned on me like, oh, this this could be a career. And it sort of built from there. Yeah. And I, I saw a few of your videos where you had strangers on on video for a few minutes and you were reading their minds, essentially. You're telling them things that uh, blew their minds, and, and they were so flabbergasted. I, I remember some of the, some of the reactions were, were pretty phenomenal. So uh, how do you access what's going on in somebody's head? It's a lot of different techniques, and like sort of it's, I think, partly for me, like now at this point in my career, it's a little bit like, when you learn to drive stick and when you first learn, it's like so much thought and there's like push the clutch down and move the the gear stick. And then once you've done it for a while, it's just sort of automatic. 
so now I'm at the point where sort of I it just feels like an automatic feeling like I ask someone to think something and I get a gut feeling about it but it's a yeah sort of a combination of just a, a pure intuition so just getting a feeling inside like often in my shows I'll say stuff and like I don't know where it's come from I just got a gut feeling like say this to this person and more often than not it's right and if it isn't that's fine too like I've built in safety nets in the show that like I'm not infallible I'm not perfect sometimes things go wonky and then there's sort of I've learned a lot about sort of psychology so understanding tells and all that sort of stuff and very interested in that sort of science bit of it but like I have a lot of friends who are sort of clinical psychologists who despair when I when I talk to them about they're like oh I just get a feeling to say like oh you lost your cat recently and people lose their minds and like they say like well, yeah but why did you say that and I'm like oh, I don't know just just sort of occurred to me yeah and it I was think like a, a hunch it, right it just kind yeah. of it was in the background and uh some people have the have clear audience they hear uh, voices, uh, things being said to them. Other ha others have clairvoyance, where they see pictures or whole kind of movies playing out. And some pe people have claircognizance, where they have this gut feeling, this hunch that turns out being right most of the time. And it sounds like that's what you're getting. Yeah, it's, yeah, sort of. A, and that occasionally there'll be sort of pictures that pop into my head and stuff. But yeah, it's just sort of a feeling. And I think. When you describe it to people like it can all seem very woo and very out there because like you know intuition seems like a sort of woolly concept but i often think of it as like our brains like a supercomputer just constantly processing all this data and what intuition is is our brain giving us the like the final answer like we're not showing you the working out just here's the thing and it's about sort of trusting that because if you were consciously aware of all that thought process your brain would explode like it'd be too much to handle so and it's just about, yeah, me trusting a lot of that. And then, like, especially in my theatre shows, I'm not afraid to sort of, you know, cheat a little bit if I have to or, like, figure out ways to bolster it. So I often think it's, yeah, for, for entertainment purposes, like, I just want to give the greatest response that I can. So, you know, if I need to set up the environment in a way that, like, I know is going to suggest a thought to someone's head, like, if I can control the playing music as people coming in, I can lay thoughts into people's heads as well. And then it... It just helps that hunch a little bit. So I'm sort of building it up from all angles. So how did you come up with the idea to draw a cat? I watched this video <laughs> where you drew a cat and you asked the the person that you were talking to to guess what the thing was that you were drawing. And I guessed it was a cat. He guessed it was a cat. <laughs> you went on this whole thing about, you know, what was your dog? And you, you're more of a dog person than a cat person or something. I don't know what... Um, I don't remember how you came uh, to this point where you're kind of leading them off the track, but before you even said anything, I knew it was a cat. And how does that work? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of that is like me working with the person. So yeah, I did a series of videos for TikTok where I downloaded Tinder because obviously like with theater shows not happening, I sort of thought like, oh, let's try this remotely. So I downloaded Tinder and matched with people but said like, oh, you know what? Like, and my bio is very clear. Like, I'm not here for dating. I'm here to do, like, psychic experiments. Like, give you some a new experience. So then we'd hop on Zoom with people, and that people seemed really up for it. And that dude, like, we talked for sort of a couple of minutes before, and I just got a sense of, like, if I ask him to think of a picture, I think he's going to think of a cat. And it was, again, just that sort of that gut feeling. So I drew it, went for it. And then, like, as as I was describing, like, oh, I've drawn a picture, there was that thought in my head of, like, he's not a cat person, he's not a cat person. But I sort of stuck with it, and I think that that's something that I've learned to be better at in my career as well, is, like, sticking with those first gut instincts and not letting the, like, anxiety voice say, like, this is a bad idea, panic. But, yeah, just thought I'd share that thought of, like, oh, you're not a cat person, are oh, you? are a dog person. And he was, and I had like an image of him with sort of the smaller dogs like Datsuns and French Bulldogs and stuff and shared that with him and that resonated with him as well. So I got sort of two bites of the apple there. But yeah, it's a lot about just getting a vibe of someone. And I quite like that experience of giving someone the feeling of being psychic as well. And whether it's me projecting it to them or whether it's me sort of figuring out what I think they're going to say and then letting them sort of walk into that situation and i think sometimes it's a bit of both like i'm sending it to him and hopefully 
he's picking up on it and I've got a good read of him and it's sort of a balancing act. I often think of it as like spinning plates. I'm sort of, I've got a few approaches going at once and hopefully he walks into one of them and it was, yeah, it was a really great reaction from him. Yeah. So that's really cool. I like the way that you just, you, you're not a purist about like, this has got to be only from the the psychic channels. Otherwise I'm, I'm not using it. No, you work in cold reading and you know, kind of the whole magician techniques and, and setting up the, the room and making suggestions kind of subliminally and that sort of thing as well. So it becomes much more of a show of a performance and not like this purest thing, like I'm not going to mess with, with the message that I'm receiving. Yeah, no, I think it's like, especially, yeah, for my entertainment shows, like it, my main goal is to give you like the most fun experience possible. So, you know, if I need to, if I need to like build in suggestion or stuff or whether it's just purely picking stuff up, I'm willing to use all of that to give the end goal of like, you've had a great time and experience something that previously you thought was impossible. And like for my entertainment shows, I'm not trying to convert anyone to a new way of approaching life or anything. I just like, I want you to have a laugh and go like, wow, that was, that was strange. And then go about your life and have sort of a fun memory yeah. from that and get involved in the show. And it's, yeah, it's sort of, I think it's interesting sort of splitting the two schools. Cause I also like, I teach a lot about tarot and divination and that sort of thing. And trying to explain the two sorts of approaches there of like in the shows, like I'll, I'm throwing everything at the wall and just giving you fun. And then when I'm teaching about divination and tarot and stuff, it's much sort of a, a slightly purer approach to like, right, let's look at the cards. Let's understand. And, and leading in that way yeah yeah now when you you could see or somehow sense that in, in that america's got talent audition that sofia vergara had a rainbow in her mind's eye she was recalling the experience of of being proposed to and there was this beautiful rainbow that she saw as it was happening she clearly from her reaction didn't share that information publicly anywhere and yet you accessed it that wasn't cold reading that was psychic right yeah it was it was like a real struggle because i knew i wanted to do something really personal with one of the judges but obviously like they're all giant celebrities and they've given hundreds of interviews so trying to like narrow down on getting them to think of something that like yeah you've never shared with anyone like this is just for you and then yeah i was like because obviously like the pressure's on at that point like in my theater show i'm with people for an hour an hour and a half so if one or two things like go slightly wonky like that's fine but the pressure on of their like the, this is your one chance to get this right and then yeah just having her imaginary and it was just just popped into my head just straight away super clearly and like, there's still the nervousness of like, what if I'm on the wrong track? What if it's something else? But I just sort of went with it. And yeah, it, it hit really strongly. And I was, I was as relieved as everyone watching at home <laughs> that it was right at the time. But that and was yeah, incredible. And I think she was picturing it so clearly as well. And you can sort of see in the footage where she sort of clearly got that memory in mind. And I often find that when I'm doing the mind reading shows, that the clearer someone can picture it in their mind, the easier it is for me then to, to pick it up from them. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. And so uh, are there other experiences where you maybe blew the minds of, of family members or longtime friends or whatever, telling them something that you couldn't possibly have known like that? it's sort of it's weird because like the longer i know someone the harder it is for me to pick stuff up and i think that's partly because like you know like you stop being objective then like what you want to be true and like the information they've told you and that you've picked up like in normal channels becomes starting to cloud that pureness of connection whereas like when i meet someone new for the first time i just like it's much easier to have an objective view of them so i tend to like leave much to their joy leave leave my family and friends minds alone most of the time my yeah my i think my partner's very glad that i'm constantly not reading their mind <laughs> that's awesome yeah that that uh that can be intimidating or a little bit nerve-wracking to think uh the person i'm just randomly chatting with here having uh, uh coffee with 
could be reading my innermost uh, <laughs> private thoughts. Not, not th This is actually something I, I learned recently, is that there is no such thing as a private thought. I did not know this until this year, but everything that we think, that we think as being private, is being broadcast out. And not just for the world of the living, but for the unseen world as well. And, and that that was a bit discombobulating. I'm like, okay, well, I better keep my mind really clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that's like, that's one of my driving forces with the mind reading show as well, is that like, I know it can seem really scary and like invasive. So I, like, I try and inject as much comedy as I can and like reassure people that like before I jump into anyone's brain, I'm getting permission and making sure that we're not tipping into... To areas they don't want to and like in my main theater show a large focus of the second half is i have everyone think of a question they wish they could ask a psychic and then i go around the room read their mind try and figure out what the question is they're thinking of and then provide an answer and occasionally yeah, i'll pick up on details and stuff and if i'm not sure that they want to want me to tell them out loud then i can sort of quietly confer with them with a microphone off so that they can say yeah that is correct but it's not for everyone's ears so and it's a, yeah, it's a, a nice balance, I think. Yeah, like I did a show a couple of years ago that's something that always sticks in my mind where I was giving a woman a reading on stage and I just suddenly had this flash that she was pregnant with twins, but she'd not told anyone she was with. And I sort of, and obviously like, I don't want to be the one to sort of burst into an Im important family moment and be like, oh, I'm making it all about me. So, yeah, there was a lot of sort of checking of, like, can I say this? Are you OK? And she was fine with it. So I sort of revealed this thought that I picked up and she confirmed it was true. And our family had a big hug afterwards. And it was an, an incredible moment and wild to me that, like, I got to be part of that incredible family moment. And it was, yeah, I think of it often. That is so cool. That is so cool. Did, uh, did you keep in touch with this person? No, sadly not. Just that's one of, one of the downsides to... Um, to doing sort of big theater shows is that yeah we have these like incredible intimate moments and then they're off into the yeah. the night and we never, never and you don't have again, a testimonial so. either to show uh <laughs> to yeah uh, that's that's a shame but what a great story what a great experience that, that uh, you were able to provide for the, for those people cool so what would um be kind of the first uh, I don't know, bits of information or ideas that we want to convey to our listener in regards to starting to develop their psychic abilities. If they wanted to uh, develop clairvoyance, claircognizance, if they wanted to work on divination or whatever, then what would be some early, easy first steps for them to take? Um. I always think a really good way to start and like, I mean, maybe partly because it's how I started, but like tarot is a really easy entry route into divination. And I think people can often be quite scared of it because it seems like a lot of information to learn. You know, there's there's all these cards and there's whole books that describe what one card means. And it seems like a lot of data, whereas actually like the way that I always teach approaching tarot is a lot about tapping into your intuition and stuff. Because like in life, we tell ourselves stories. So like if you're in a car accident, you might say like, oh, I'm really unlucky because that happened. Or you might say, oh, I'm really lucky because it could have been worse. And actually like I'm, I turned out OK. So like those stories surround us all the time. And what tarot does is present us in picture form with stories that we can inject ourselves into and then we challenge the story we're telling ourselves about the life around us. So it's a lot about rather than learning from a book what this card means, I encourage people to like get tarot cards and just look at the picture like it's like it's a frame in a comic book, but without any text and say, like, what's the story that's happening here? And then they sort of tell themselves that story. And often like that sort of intuitive approach to it combined with our own intuition and that Bring, starts bringing out things that we've been ignoring or stuff that like we've picked up and been pushed away and then you put yourself into that and it's a lot about yeah re-engaging with that sense of intuition because as we were saying earlier like i think often people can be a bit afraid of it and they it's a bit whoa we should ignore it and this is a really good way of getting back in touch with listening to what 
your body's telling you and what you're picking up and it's it builds up that confidence and i think it's a really and then yeah you build more into understanding the tarot and picking up those pictures and they often encourage people not to pick up the guidebooks at all at least for a while because i think your personal understanding of what the story the picture's telling you is so much more important than what someone who wrote a book has decided it is because like things have different meanings in different contexts like wearing a bikini in the supermarket is different than wearing it at the beach. So why shouldn't a tarot card mean something different to you with your life experience than it does to someone who lives 6,000 miles away and lives a completely different life? And I find that that sort of approach is really useful for building up and starting that journey of tapping into yourself and your understanding more. Yeah. And something similar that I've experienced is I've been getting a lot of angel numbers you know, like 333 I got today. I got 1111 three times this morning. And I, I'll, I'll check the, the Angel Numbers 101 book by Doreen Virtue. But oftentimes I'll also just Google it. And whatever pops for me, which, there are going to be so many results. And then I can look at the image results. I could look at just the text results. I'll just go wherever I feel drawn to. And then that will be the message for me. And so that's very yeah, personal I, and it's tapping into my intuition, but being prompted to do that too. So it's like I'm getting a little nudge, a little tap on the shoulder from the higher realms. And then I'm following that and just being kind of guided to whatever uh, I intuit is the, is the message from that. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful sort of approach forward as well. Yeah, to sort of, to take those nudges because i think also like sometimes people turn to tarot expecting that it's going to say like you'll meet the love of your life next tuesday will be called terry and it will be at 5 p.m like and i actually think like you know intuition and the universe like doesn't work like that and being more open to like those gentle nudges of you know the universe saying like pay attention now like stop think now and then taking that action to be like right what resonates with me is so much more powerful and so much more empowering as well because like you're not then surrendering your control of your life over to some pieces of paper. You're saying like, I, I'm listening and now taking full reins and going to lead this forward. Yeah. Yeah. Now, something you said a few minutes ago uh, reminded me of a Chinese proverb and you, you're talking about like if you get in a car accident or you break a bone or something that can be seen as unfortunate. Maybe it's lucky or it's fortunate in this aspect that you didn't get more seriously hurt but everything that happens for us to us is actually for us and for our our soul's highest best good now that can be hard for somebody to uh accept if they've had a lot of tragedy in their life in particular but if let's say it would have led to something much worse happening but it didn't happen because they had that car accident they don't get to see that until after they pass and then their whole life review and everything. So uh, it reminds me of this Chinese proverb and it goes something like this. And you, you may have heard this before. I, I, I happen to love this. A farmer and his son had a beloved stallion who helped the family earn a living. One day the horse ran away and their neighbors exclaimed, your horse ran away. What terrible luck. The farmer replied, maybe so, maybe not. We'll see. A few days later, the horse returned home, leading a few wild horse, uh, wild horses, mares back to the farm as well. The neighbor shouted out, your horse has returned and brought several horses home with him. What great luck. <laughs> the farmer answers, maybe so, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, and it goes on, you know, so his son uh, gets thrown off the horse and breaks his leg. And your son broke his leg. What terrible luck. Maybe so, maybe not. And then, you know, he ends up not getting... Uh, recruited into the army because he had a broken bone <laughs> and so what uh, tremendous luck you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and so it goes on and I just think there's so many instances of that happening in our lives but we don't see it we don't see that the road actually split there is two paths and we hit a crossroads and we went down one path that if we'd gone the other path we'd be dead by now uh, but it seems unfortunate because we broke a bone in the process, but it was actually quite fortunate. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I definitely think, and it's sort of, 
I think a lot is about sort of what's going to serve you at this moment as well. Like the looking at the stories that you're telling yourself and sort of saying, yeah, like, you know, this terrible thing has happened and I can think of it as like a terrible thing and it should be a reason that I give up and stuff. But like, is that serving you? Is that giving you the fulfillment and the, the joy that you want in your life? Because if it isn't and there's a different way of approaching it, then, yeah, you get to this point where you say, like, OK, like that happened. And like, you know, saying like, oh, you know, you were in a car accident and actually I'm really lucky that it wasn't worse doesn't doesn't erase. And I think this is something that sometimes people get caught up on is like it doesn't erase your right to be upset or to be hurt by that incident. It like those feelings are still valid. What it is is saying like, OK, and like, but is there a way of approaching this that now means that you can go forward from this as opposed to it? it is a roadblock that's going to stop you moving forward. And you often see this sort of when you're talking to people about failure and stuff and they sort of they say like, oh, well, it failed. So I shouldn't I shouldn't keep trying because like that was painful and stuff. And you say like, well, you know, that that failure is painful and that doesn't invalidate that. But maybe that failure is just a, like a learning point. And you can see it as actually really useful. That was good data and you can move forward so that you're not going to fail like that again. So rather than it being evidence of why you should stop, it's evidence of why you should keep going. And like, how does that resonate with you? And then again, just always bringing it back to like, you know, how, how do I feel inside? How does my intuition feel? And just trying to like differentiate that from how like the anxiousness feels or like that, those sort of maladaptive behaviors that you've approached that like, all serve you like being nervous and being anxious like serve good purposes but sometimes they can be hyper aware and they're not serving you in the same way so yeah finding that that route forward but still honoring when you know when things are bad you're allowed to say that they're bad and we're sort of i'm always very careful i think it can be quite prevalent in the sort of new age of like the the toxic positivity of like oh just see it as a good thing and like fight still making that space to say like oh no actually it was terrible but we can find a way forward that this is this serves me mm, yeah so when one thing i've i've uh understood recently about intuition is that it it tends to come in uh, just unexpected and out of nowhere and it tends to come in really fast whereas if you're overthinking things you're ruminating that's your subconscious mind that's your stinking thinking and so forth that's that's usually not the you know the whispers from the higher realms so um how do you increase your your signal (laughs) your the the ability to receive the intuition so it comes in hard and fast and all the time i think this is it's yeah it's a lot about sort of practicing that approach and like accepting it in small doses like this is something that my partner teaches uh, self-defense and this is something they talk about a lot is like you you sometimes be in like a party and you'll get a vibe like you know like vibes got weird like i should leave or like you there's an event happening and you get a vibe like oh i don't know if i should go or not and it's sort of about testing that a little bit and saying like okay like you don't know if you should go or not, but you end up going and actually it ends up being a terrible party. Cool. That was intuition. And then you acknowledge what that feeling was like and like, okay, like pat on my back, intuition tried. I didn't listen, notice it again. And then the next time that you have like, a, oh, I should go, but no, I don't know. And then you go and actually it turns out to be a great party. You say, okay, that was, that was the stinking thinking, as you said. And it's about just like listening, exploring and finding that difference. Because I think, it's easy to lump it into one feeling, but like often it's different feelings. And you, as you say, like it, it feels different in your body. Either it comes fast or there's that sort of creeping feeling and just building up that and being willing to sort of explore in sort of safe environments of like, oh yeah, that was my intuition and I should have listened. And the more you get used to differentiating those feelings, the clearer those signals become. So then it, it becomes much easier to just sort of say like, no, okay, that feels wrong. And I, I know that this is a feeling I should trust. Yeah, that's a great kind of scientific approach. <laughs> Very, uh, uh, yeah, it's like the scientific method. I like that. Now, going back to tarot, if someone has a negative reaction to hearing the word tarot, 
they think that it's satanic they think it's dark or or uh, black magic what do you say in response to that um so i often like that there's sort of two approaches to this like, one is that like i will explain that sort of you know there there's a lot of myth that surrounds tarot you know like the people say like oh they were created by the ancient egyptians or maybe they're cursed and there's a lot of understanding but actually it's just they're just pictures on a piece of paper and with the same sort of explanation i said earlier you know like they give us stories and we can tell stories and it's no different and then if people are still sort of unsure i uh, i do a lot of corporate work and i found that that was sort of an objection from corporate bookers as well that sort of not necessarily that they thought the cards were the devil's work or stuff but they were worried that you know if if a client thinks that and then there's an awkward moment so i designed like my own version of the tarot that is just sort of random symbols or sometimes even if i'm in a social situation i'll grab like a newspaper and tear it up because newspapers are full of pictures and they they still all tell our stories and sort of just showing someone a way that is separate from the sort of i think the hollywood image of you know someone holding a tarot deck telling them when they're going to die and just giving someone that experience. And I think often that can break down the understanding of, you know, saying like, you know, Hollywood tells you one thing, but this is actually the reality. And it's, it's probably not as spooky or as sexy as Hollywood wants you to think, but it can be a lot more, a lot more insightful and giving people those space. And yeah, as I say, like if they're, if they're very set against it, like I entirely respect those views and I have, different divination methods if they're into exploring something that is sort of tarot adjacent that they feel more comfortable with and it's yeah it's a a process of sort of education mm. so you you mentioned it can tear up a newspaper and use that kind of like a tarot deck how does that work exactly are you are you uh, doing this on stage and you just tear it into thirds and then thirds again or you clip the pictures out with scissors or how does that work yeah so it's often i'd often do it in more like sort of casual environments where someone says like oh i'd love tarot but like it's cursed and i don't want to get in that and sort of in a method of explaining yeah just grab a grab a newspaper and just yeah just sort of randomly tear it up just sort of tear it into quarters into weights or whatever and just throw the pieces out right, i'll grab three and if there's like a quarter of a picture on there cool that's fine like extrapolate look at what we've got of that picture what do you imagine's in the rest of the picture like let's build up an imaginary tarot card from that or if there's no pictures but there's a few words like right let's take those words like what story could those words like independent of what you think the article is like whether you've read the news for that day and you know what that's from if you just took those words what story would you make up right that's that's the same as a tarot card you no know, just because someone didn't draw it a few hundred years ago doesn't mean that it's not as valid let's go from there and just sort of finding a way of building divination into that and i'm sort of big into finding those ways that like i really like in my show i often use sort of just random things for divination we might start with tarot but i might say like i'll just grab an object out of your bag get the first thing that comes to hand and we'll use that as if it was a tarot card so you've got a packet of tissues so let's say so this is a journey of of sadness um but maybe also healing and like maybe you were crying and there's a story of being sad about something but also acknowledging that sadness can be a release and you sort of build from there and it's sort of giving that experience of like divination can come from anything and just because we're sort of used to the idea of tarot doesn't mean that it needs to stop there it's not sort of a walled off thing okay so let's uh, hypothetically say that one of the tarot type pieces of, of newspaper has a picture of a racehorse on it, or maybe a, a, a mention of a, uh, a race, uh, a horse race. What's the meaning of that for, for the person potentially? Um, so I'd say, so, okay, so we are looking at races there. So it's about sort of moving forward and sort of charging forward. But I think often, it's very easy in a race to know where the end point is because someone's marked it for us. But in life, it can feel like we're constantly in a race, but we're either racing towards an end point that someone else has decided for us, or we've not even looked at the end point. We're just so caught up in the moment of the race. Like if you're looking at like dog racing, say they're just chasing that fake rabbit. They're not thinking about what comes next or what I catch. And I often think of, 
I remember having a picnic with a friend of mine a couple of years ago and she was there with her kid and there was a a pigeon and they were both just chasing the pigeon, you know, like kids like to do. And then my friend caught the pigeon and there was a great moment where she turned to me like holding this pigeon and said, I don't know what to do next. Like, because that had never occurred. And I think sort of taking that meaning from the race of saying like, maybe slow down a little bit and like you don't need to be caught in this race really maybe what you should be looking at is what's the end point and is that end point something that someone else has decided for you or should you be pausing a moment to think like what is the end point i want and then racing towards that as opposed to just blindly moving forward as fast as you can mm. i like that yeah that's really cool now there's there's a i don't know much about tarot but I, I believe that there's uh, something like Queen of Cups or something like that. That's one of the, the, the cards. That is indeed. What does that mean? Um, so I often think of, I have, my I have my teaching deck here, actually, so I'll grab it and we can talk through it. Um, but the Queen of Cups, Cups is often a suit of fulfillment. So it's sort of feeling content and happy. And the, um, the court cards are the sort of often seen as the end of the journey. So I like to see uh, all of the suits as a sort of journeys from the beginning and setting out in a search of something to a level of attainment. And they also come with sort of warnings. So with the Queen of Cups, it's a sort of, it's a journey towards fulfillment with a sort of an air of compassion. Like I think often when people start going after things for their own for their own pleasure it's easy to forget about those around us so when we look at the queen of cups there you can sort of see that the the queen is sort of sat and for our audio listeners the queen is sat and she's contemplatively looking at the cup that she's got that's quite ornate and it's a sort of a feeling of understanding that this this cup comes from everyone else around you the queen's often a very sort of caring and compassionate figure so it's a sort of approach to dealing with fulfillment in group in a in a community-based approach and taking that sort of compassionately and also taking the the forethought in the same sort of way we were talking about with the race earlier that this queen is sort of looking at what's made her fulfilled and really contemplating it and not just saying like i'm gonna go after lots of things because that seems like what I want. She sat down and thought like, what is it exactly that I want and how can it benefit me and also my community and sort of leading forward like that. And as I say, the cards have like lots of different meanings depending on how you look at it. And I think a good, a good example I used for a while and it sort of become relevant again is um, the Philip Pullman books, his dark materials and like HBO and BBC made a series and there's sort of the golden compass in that, that the, the girl sort of learns to read. I know I have to think that's a really good way of explaining to people how tarot works as well, that like when she's divining with the compass, there's a moon and it might mean cycle or it might mean darkness or it might mean this. And it's about her feeling. And yeah, sort of when I pull like the queen of cups, it may be for someone that I'm sat in front of my intuition says, this is more about community and maybe you should be looking more at that. Whereas some, for another person, I might say like, oh, this feels for me that it's more about more about looking inwards and really sort of evaluating what's what's making you happy. And it's sort of amorphous in that way. And I think that's a really nice way of getting to connect with someone as well. And sometimes sharing both of those meanings and saying like, which which speaks to you in this moment? And then they tell me. And for tarot readings, I really like it to be a two way street. It's not me sort of giving a lecture because I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in like you being involved in the process of mm. getting that ownership. Yeah. So you, sounds like there's intuition involved in uh, kind of deciding which of the multiple meanings is the one that's most relevant for the person you're reading for. Uh, I'm curious, did you know that I was going to bring up the Queen of Cups before I did? No, no, no idea at all. I sort of, I think for a lot of the sort of, the intuition and the mind reading stuff, I have to sort of be tuned in for it. Whereas okay. for the divination, it's much easier just to sort of that once I'm in the moment, it just sort of flows and I'd like listening to my intuition and I'm just going with what, what feels right. Got it. Okay. So I just recently learned, I was at a family reunion a couple of weeks ago and I learned one of my family members, surprisingly to me has been playing around with tarot 
and was able to pick the winner of the Kentucky Derby because of uh, her use of tarot. She didn't bet nearly enough. <laughs> In other <laughs> words, she bet very little <laughs> uh, on, on that. She wasn't certain that that was uh, the the thing that she should do, so she just made a small bet. In retrospect, she could have made a much larger one and made a lot of money, but I'm curious, how does that work to actually figure out the winner of a horse race or whatever the thing is through the use of tarot? Yeah, I've never, I've never been as lucky to have that sort of connection. Otherwise, I'd, I'd have much nicer suits, I think. But, um... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think for, for different people, it's sort of tapping into different things. And yeah, often sort of occasionally, like when I'm giving readings to people, they will come with like, oh, can the cards tell me who's winning the Super Bowl? And like, I think in part as well, because that's not something that I have any knowledge of. So it's hard to tap into an intuition base of something that I'm not connected to in that way. But yeah, it's a sort of it's an often asked question like, oh, so if you're psychic, like, why haven't you won the lottery? And <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way <laughs> yeah it's it's not that's not quite the approach and yeah it's and i often think as well like with my approach to reading and stuff it's it's so much about looking at yeah like the path people are on at this moment with full knowledge that like everything's changing all the time so it's so you know if someone decides to act slightly differently then those those insights change see so yeah, i've never quite been able to have a, a prediction like that but i would I would like to get in with your family member and hopefully we can <laughs> collaborate next year. So. <laughs> oh, awesome. Now you have a coin that you uh, have in your online store for divination. Uh, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of that versus using a tarot deck or something that has many more options, Oracle cards or whatever you call it. Like why a coin? Um, so it was an outgrowth of sort of where we were talking earlier about me, like having to deal with corporate clients being sort of concerned about like the mysticism of tarot and stuff. And it started off like I built my own Oracle deck in sort of 2015 that I used a lot. And then partly it was because I was on the road so much that I was going through so many decks. Like I give cards away to people when it really resonates with them or they get wet or they get lost. And I'm like a like I have ADHD so I'm a terrible fidgeter and things so sort of trying to combine all of those requirements of like something that would last longer and something that still carried all those meanings meant that I ended up building this coin which is sort of something that's very tactile you can play with it and then also it's got a whole selection of symbols on it and it's something that I think I found a lot in, in especially in corporate spheres that, you know, sort of like yes, no coins or lucky coins were sort of a real thing that people engaged with. So whilst they would be saying like, oh, you know, it's, um, you know, tarot's too woo for me, but like I do have a lucky coin that if I don't bring it to meetings, then the deal won't go through. <laughs> and just sort of, yeah, taking that approach and you sort of, you get to a point where, there's a whole collection of symbols on both sides and a yes, no. So it's got all that, all of the approach of sort of a major arcana of tarot, but combined in one thing that sort of fits in your pocket, you can just pop in your wallet because, yeah, sort of, I, I understand not everyone's as comfortable as me of sort of ripping up a, a newspaper and giving a reading from that and just having a tactile thing that you can, rather than shuffling it up and peel, pulling one card, I just sort of throw it up in the air, catch it, and whatever symbol my eye is drawn to first, that's the symbol we'll go with. And then I give a reading from that. And it's a nice sort of tactile, fun and long lasting thing that people can use that has become sort of the backbone of my shows now that rather than using tarot in my theatre shows, I use the coin because it's it's fun and is, again, just great to give away to people as well as sort of here's your new lucky coin. Yeah, that's cool. Now, how does it compare to the pendulum as a way to get yes, no answers to whatever questions you're asking? Yeah, I think it's it's a slightly different approach. Um, I think for the pendulum, I often feel that the pendulum's tapping into our own our own inner understanding, and often like we can surprise ourselves with the pendulum if we're asking a yes or no question, and at some level we know the answer. 
and it but consciously we're ignoring it so we're the pendulum reveals those inner thoughts whereas i find with the the icon the yes no response is is a lot about your reaction to the yes no as well so you know there's that old sort of you know flip a coin in the air you'll know what the right answer is and i sort of i find that as well when i get people to flip the coin and we get the answer like yes and you you instantly see them have a reaction to that and they once they're forced to face a decision then instantly things become clearer and like i think i think we've all been in that experience where we sort of we snap at someone or we say something that's been bubbling in our head and the moment it leaves our mouth we either think oh i shouldn't have said that or like oh i'm glad that that's finally out in the air and i think getting people to that point of like right often it's it's the fear of making a decision that means that we procrastinate so right let's just assume that decision's made and you've not made it the coins made it yes you're doing that thing right now we can now all of those barriers of having good insight and clarity have moved out the way because the decision's made now how does your intuition feel about it and you get sort of a different approach to it Mm, i got that okay now you mentioned a few minutes ago that you have adhd is that something that you see as a benefit or a detriment is that a superpower or is that a disability um I think it can be a bit of both, really. I think it's sort of I've sort of come to it late in life with a realization, I think, because I I definitely as a child, especially was much more on the sort of the hyper focused as opposed to the sort of the can't focus end of the spectrum. So it was it was never really picked up in school. And I think that, yeah, it can be it can be really useful when I'm in sort of a hyper focus mode and I can get lots done. But then like when my when my focus wanes and stuff it's sort of it can be a challenge but i think i've always learned to deal with it and constantly learning new ways and i think like i'm often big about like talking about it freely because i think yeah people can worry about like oh if i say it like will people think you know that they can't trust me to focus on tasks or whether they'll see it as a disability and be worried about it and then i'm often wary as well to sort of say like oh it's a superpower because that that does discount like the very hard days and the days where you know it's a struggle or it has like an impact on your mood and there's sort of a comorbidity with sort of depression and anxiety and that sort of thing and struggling in that ways and I'm often just sort of very open about it often because yeah like especially like if I'm giving readings to people and we're getting into their really personal details and their lives like it's only fair that I'm open about my life and my approach to things as well so it's sort of yeah it can it can be both a struggle and a superpower, I think. And it's sort of, you, you take the good and you take the bad. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes you more li- relatable, especially for somebody who has ADD or ADHD. It also can be distracting if you're fidgeting and stuff. But me personally, I think of it as a superpower. And the way I see it is that back in the stone age days there were the hunters there were the gatherers but there were also the spotters i don't know if you've ever heard of spotters but no they were the the folks in the tribe who kept the tribe alive because they would be first to notice that the herd is on the move oh there goes our food supply they're leaving right or there's uh the neighboring tribe sneaking up on us they're the first to notice that so nobody gets murdered and that was uh, an essential part of our survival as a species, having those spotters. And now they're labeled with this disability or disorder of ADD and ADHD. And I, I, that, for one, that label doesn't serve us. And for two, it, it doesn't recognize the value evolutionarily of the spotters of the ADD and ADHD labeled folks. What are yeah, your thoughts on it- that? Yeah, I think it's definitely like, and it's, yeah, sort of, as I say, like I came to it later in life. So it's still something that I'm sort of learning a lot about and exploring because it's so easy. It's the same sort of with glasses as well. Like I didn't realize I need glasses until I was about 17 because I just assumed everyone saw a bit blurry. And like the way that I could see what the teacher was writing on the board was because of like the shapes her hand was making as opposed to what was on the board. And that was just sort of my default assumption. So it's interesting at this point to be challenging my default assumptions of like, oh, not everyone's brain works this way. And so, yeah, understanding the sort of 
the benefits and the challenges are like and yeah it's just, it's just been really interesting to yeah sort of see those those benefits and the evolutionary benefits and then also like the challenges that come with it that are just sort of things i assumed everyone experienced and then to discover like no that's that's just you and a small group of people and it's yeah it's been a it's been a fun journey and i'm sort of it's challenging but it's a good a good journey to explore and i think it's it's less scary than i think Mm -hmm. people like i've had a few friends who are sort of identified with a lot of what i've talked about and said like oh you know i'd love to go and talk to my doctor but like i'm scared and i think it's if it's if it's some benefit and if there's things like getting in the way of you living your life to your level of fulfillment yeah sort of reaching out and seeing because i've definitely like learned coping techniques that previously like yeah i'd have really bad focus days and learning new ways of approaching that as well I mean i'm sort of a better functioning human being i can be more productive and then i can also share those and everything that i learn sort of goes into my readings then so i can pass that information on to others as well mm. do you do you meditate uh yeah i've sort of i've started doing a lot more it sort of i was never very good at the consistency of meditating like i do bits and bobs and i do it for a week and then fall off and i'm getting better at sort of building up the the practice of meditating and i've got much more into doing like in the pandemic sort of doing yoga as well and approaching that as as a, a daily task and often as a like a a physical task as well i think that i i struggled especially at the start with with the sort of the slower more meditative yoga because i was used to like being at the gym and you know run lift the heavy thing be active so it was sort of a nice route forward and i ended up doing sort of a brand of yoga that was much more upbeat and stuff and finding finding that meditative and this is something that i've sort of learned approaching with the adhd as well as that like i often sometimes think meditation what people imagine is you know like sitting very still thinking nothing doing nothing whereas actually like, you can approach that meditative state in a lot of different ways and actually like some of the like dealing through tarot cards and like being active in that is still meditation i'm still fulfilling that mindset it's just it's in a much more active way than i think sometimes people assume that you have to be sat in the lotus position in a dark room right yeah you don't have to do 20 minutes it doesn't have to be in this particular time of day and and uh in a particular uh mode etc yeah it's good okay now uh, a couple more questions before we close out this uh this interview Tell us about Ghosts of Enfield. What is that? And do you communicate with ghosts? Like, how does that all work? Yeah, so I am, in 2013, I wrote, uh, I was working with a friend of mine who was an immersive theater director. So he sort of creates and directs shows where rather than going into a theater and just watching a show, you're in the show, you're playing a character, you're sort of swept up in that. So I designed a seance version of that where rather than like actually doing a seance with a medium who's going to talk to like the the departed spirits of the people in the room, I sort of thought like, right, what's, what's a Hollywood experience of a seance? And then what can I bring that is authentic of what a seance is like? And how can we find the nexus of those two experiences to give someone like a theatrical experience of like seeing things go bump in the night and having that experience? And that sort of grew into me doing this sort of immersive theatre experience of seance. And then during lockdown, because I grew up in North London in a place called Enfield, that's very famous for the Enfield haunting, which is the basis of The Conjuring 2. And it's sort of one of the most well-documented haunting cases. I became really interested in that story. And my parents have lived in Enfield since the 70s, since like all that was going on and asking them about it and hearing all these other ghost stories that were happening. I thought it'd be fun to try and bring that immersive theatre experience into the digital realm and have everyone join in with an online seance from their own home. And I was back in Enfield, so it was a great experience to sort of explore that. And it sort of, it walks that line of, I have a mindset of like an experience I want to guide people through, but also stuff does crop up and we've had, all sorts of things happen in the immersive theatre seances that like isn't under my control. People have visions, people have experiences that are sort of 
beyond explanation and it's a nice sort of combination of things and a, a safe space as well to sort of explore that because i think that it can be it can be very heavy and i don't think that that sort of format is often the best way to approach sort of dealing with grief or wanting to talk to spirits in that way and it it follows along the sort of mindset i have with the entertainment shows of like i want to give you this experience that gives you space to question what you think about the world but i'm not trying to convert you in any way it's just it's meant to be fun or spooky or interactive and that's sort of what ghosts of enfield was is this experience of grabbing a whole bunch of people and we had a play along contingent so we had people watching on a youtube stream and then we had six people that had been randomly chosen from the people that bought tickets to fully take part on screen and see what they could pick up about the spirit and it was a yeah it was a really interesting and fun experiment to do with people mm. do you talk to ghosts no i've never i've never sort of had uh, any medium skills and it's like a, a few friends that are mediums and it's always fascinating to get to watch them work and have this sort of and i think that's the other thing as well that when people hear sort of psychic they instantly think medium and that's sort of where they go and i often describe it as like um psychic is like saying musician like you know all guitarists are musicians but not all musicians play guitar and it's the same sort for me you know like saying psychic like some are mediums but not all psychics are mediums and like that's never been my bag and i i love seeing it done and i love seeing that connection but it's not not one of my skill sets unfortunately gotcha did you ever get uh readings from from uh, mediums i've had a few yeah and it's been it's always a, a, an enlightening experience and i think it's it's fun to explore and you know some are more accurate than others and some are, are ponders so you sort of go home and ponder what that connection meant or what was being said but i i sort of absolutely love um anytime like when i'm on tour if there's a there's a local tarot shop whatever and i can get in for a reading i'm straight in there like i love sort of experiencing it all and seeing how other people work and and just as yeah as much as it's my career i'm still sort of a fan as well and getting to do that being an enthusiast yeah yeah awesome uh one more question have you had any kind of past life memories or glimpses no i sort of i i've become more interested in past life sort of recently and i've yeah i've got a friend who's sort of very into it and we sort of it was one of the we'd had plans to do a past life thing there in the uk and then like lockdown happened and then i moved to the the states so we never we never got that opportunity but it's interesting hearing her stories of exploration and i'm sort of intrigued to hear more about it because it is sort of it's of the the further end of my exploration so they're sort of i know in my head like reading someone's mind seems much more normal than being able to dive into a past life so i'm sort of intrigued by it but still bringing that sort of healthy skepticism and and curiosity about it yeah okay fair enough i mean i only just recently did my first uh past life uh regression uh, awesome and... how did how was it it was interesting. I had a past life memory relating to my fear of water. Apparently, I was dared to jump off a bridge by some teenage friends. I was a teenager myself, and I drowned. So that would also explain my fear of heights, too. Yeah, that was interesting. And it, it felt really real, very real. And I looked nothing like I, I, I did in this life. Yeah, so, yeah right. it's sort of it's out there <laughs> it's pretty out there you know it's so interesting how those sort of those glimpses connect with how we are now and yeah sort of as i say yeah, it's it's sort of an area that i'm interested in seeing more in and yeah approaching with that sort of out there skepticism but also i think i'm just i we've just started watching the x files i'd never seen it before and it, it sort of connects with me you're a little late like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just, I skipped past it. Like it was just never something on my radar. And then my partner couldn't believe I'd never seen it. So we started watching it. And yeah, that real sort of like, you know, I, I want to believe, but also that skepticism and sort of combining those two, it really speaks to me. So it's a. Uh... That's funny. Yeah, you know, you would like, uh, you'd like the show Manifest as well on Netflix. Yeah. Check awesome. that one out. Check it out. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's some there's some fun psychic stuff in there yeah all right well thank you so much this was a lot of fun peter and if our listener viewer wants to learn more from you work with you maybe hire you for a, a corporate gig or something how do they get in touch yeah, so you can just head over to my website, peterantonio.com, and all the information's there. Or find me on all of the social medias. I'm sort of posting regularly on those. Like, you can follow me on TikTok, because I'm cool and down with the kids, at Peter Antonio, <laughs> or Instagram, Peter Antonio. So, yeah, just a, a Google, and I'll pop up. And, yeah, I'd love to love to get to work with all of you. Yeah, and Ant- Antonio has a U at the end, so make sure yeah, you so have A-N-T-O-N-I-O-U. that. Yes, A-N-T-O-N-I-O-U yeah Just perfect all right well thank you peter and oh you also have an online store and you can get your tarot decks and the the uh the the coin and all that sort of st- fun stuff uh from your online store yep so yeah so you can the coin comes with like a full book that explains my whole approach to reading and i'm currently like filming a lecture on how to get into tarot reading but it's sort of Take, taking longer than I'd like because of sort of filming commitments with AGT and stuff slowed everything down. But hopefully all those resources will be available soon as well. Okay, awesome. And I'm really, really excited to see what happens with AGT. You deserve to be on in their show, like in, in the Vegas show, for sure. So Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, listener. I think it's really something to explore, to try to... Uh, divine something see if you can get an answer and see where it leads and we'll catch you on the next episode i'm your host stefan spencer signing off